We are opening up the book of Philippians and Join the Shadows is going to be a fantastic series. The book of Philippians was written around AD 60 and the church in Philippi is located in uh, Macedonia, so just north, north of Greece and it's really interesting that the church in Philippi you can track it in the book of Acts where its genesis was. It was Paul's second missionary journey and he was in this uh, town and a woman named Lydia had a power encounter with God and radi- radically got saved and formed the, the embryonic core of this new fledgling church community. I love the fact that God, when he planted churches, picked women to do it. Don't you think that's fantastic in the early church? It was the New Testament pattern that God built the church on women and part of core leadership teams. There was female apostles, there was females involved with church planting teams. I think that's amazing for the record. Um, I think it's also amazing that uh, we have that beautiful story of Paul and Silas in Acts 16 and and, and where they are liberated from the chains, they have a miracle take place, but rather than escape, they stay because they care about the Philippian jailer. And the Philippian jailer falls to his knees and he says, what must I do to be saved? Because I want the reality and the love and the transformative power that you have. I want that for myself. And he falls to his knees and it says that him and his entire household, so they were all saved and they were baptized. Which is, uh, and, and so they formed part of this church. So we have this young church, and 10 years later, Paul is writing to them in Philippi. And the love and the sense of common mission, as you read through the text of the book of Philippians, it washes over you. And it is, I, I love the book of Philippians because unlike other books, he is not writing to address a crisis. I like that. Because life is not all about addressing crises. Life is about a lot of good and a lot of bad and a lot of in-between. And so that's what he's doing in Philippians. He's just saying, hey, so-and-so is going to visit you and um, this person's going to visit you and I long to be with you and I'm giving you an insight into where I am. And hey, by the way, beware of these false teachers and you might want to look out for this and I want to share with you a revelation I've had of this, this and this. And so it's a pastoral letter that's not trying to, it, it, it covers... Uh, unique areas out of uh, some of the other books that uh, letters that Paul writes, but the overwhelming theme is the theme of of joy, and I love that. I love the way he writes, and and he is in prison, and we don't know. We suspect it was around 60 AD, but we don't know for sure because this is the thing about Paul. He's writing a book where he speaks so much about hope, so much about love, so much about joy, so much about generosity, so much about having a positive mental approach to life and not being governed by anxiety and fear. But he's writing it in the midst of being in chains. And I love the fact that it's, we don't know when he wrote it because he was in chains a number of times. I think if I went to jail once, that would be enough for me. I'd be like, I'm moving to Australia where I can preach the gospel and not get thrown into jail. You know what I mean? It's like once would be enough. But for Paul, this was like a reoccurring thing in his life. And so we don't know exactly when, but we suspect it was probably when he was in Rome, around 10 years after the birth of the church. You see, I believe that this passage that we're about to read, it's going to give us some keys to understanding joy. But I believe that joy is the birthright of every Christian. And I believe that joy, if you're, if, if you're fed income this morning and you're saying, I want joy in my life, I want to tell you that you can pray and believe that you have or already have it, even if you don't recognize it, and you can grow in your awareness and the richness of enjoyment and experience of the joy-filled life. It is the normal Christian life. It is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And it is not just for a certain type of happy, clappy Christians or particular people that live in fantasy world. Some of the most grounded, intelligent people 
that have lived through the most tragedy and suffering are some of the most joyful people I have ever met. Do you know what I mean? Some of the people that have had the easiest lives that you will ever meet have the least joy-filled lives you will ever meet. I just felt um, a bit of an analogy coming on. I'm going to go with it. And I'm also a bit tired, so I might put my feet up. Um, Phil, can you just help me with that chair? Bring that up. That would be great. And I just, I know we have a no coffee policy, but I thought you'd, Phil, I've just got a coffee there. Can you pass me up that coffee and that little cup? That would be great. Thanks. So I'm just, I preached my heart out in the early service. And there's that little cup as well next to it. That would be great. Thanks. Up on here. And I just thought, you know, the church, you're going to be gracious towards me because you've got to be gracious in church, don't you? Yep. All right. Thanks, Phil. Put your hands together for Phil Bryce, Pastor Phil. And, and I just thought, really, who can be bothered standing up for that long? So I might just sit down because I'm speaking on joy and what brings me joy? It's relaxing, chilling. Um, can I hear an amen? Yep. Hey, that was the biggest amen of the morning. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and something that brings me joy is coffee. Yeah, I love coffee. Sorry, is this inappropriate? Um, there's no purpose for this. I just want to drink coffee. No, um, I remember once I was, you know how preachers, they always name drop famous preachers that they've met and stuff like that. Well, I really haven't met many famous preachers, except the time when I was Earl McManus's driver. This is my only famous Christian speaker story. Um, but I was driving Earl McManus, um, quite a prolific author and pastor, and out of uh, United States, uh, Los Angeles, and uh, yeah, just driving him around for a conference, and Tanya, don't Snapchat me, um, and uh, <laughs> and it was fascinating, you know some little conversations that you never forget, do you know what I mean? You just never forget them, well, this is how profound my brain is, we're drinking coffee in the car, and he's just been traveling around the, the coffee shops, and, and, and he's just taking note of the Adelaide's coffee culture, and he's just drinking like this, and he said, have you ever realized, and he, and, he, and he saw me drinking the coffee, and he said, you know you're doing it wrong. I'm like, what do you mean? Who are you to tell me, you American? Like, last time I checked, Americans aren't the world experts in coffee. I'm an Australian. And he, and he said, no, no, you're doing it wrong. He said, because you see, so much of the enjoyment of coffee See, most of us drink coffee, we, we, we get drive through and we're in a hurry and we're like this and we're multitasking, and we're drinking on the run. But what he said is he said, really, coffee, it's not just about the taste, it's about the smell. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, some of you are like, oh yeah, oh yeah, now you're speaking my language, brother. Come on, preach it, Tim. Let it out, let it out. And so... When you drink coffee without the lid on, it tastes so much better. Just throwing it out there. You're welcome. Um, and so when, because it's a multi-sensory experience. Now, let me take this a step further. Life is more than just drinking coffee on the run through a little hole in a plastic lid. It's about experiencing the coffee. And you know what? I'm going to name drop not just guest speakers, but exotic locations. I remember when I was in Italy, and um, I remember in Italy, they don't serve coffee in cups like this. Do you know how they serve coffee? Uh-oh. Okay. It's all right. It fell in my jeans. Okay. So, first of all, it's black. It doesn't have milk in it, so I should have thought of that before I did this illustration. But people recognize that no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what bills need to be paid, no matter what things need to be done at work, there is always time to plunk your backside on one of these things called a chair and to drink coffee like a civilized human being. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And so in Italy, even when people are on the run, they've got little benches. They've got those little stools and they're, they're drinking their coffees and, and they just drink it. And I loved it. I love that coffee culture. And do you know what it told me? It told me that sometimes 
we experience something in such a diluted form of its best uh, form. And I believe that's the same with joy. Now, if you are a Christian, you have some experience of joy, but I want to suggest that some of you are experiencing joy. It's like you're experiencing it through this plastic lid, and it is such a dim reflection of the radical, joy-filled, wonderful life that is awaiting for you. And this morning's message from the book of Philippians chapter 1, I want to give you some keys from the life of Paul and how we can unlock the joy that is already ours in Christ because joy comes not through things, but it comes through the Spirit of God who brings it out in our life. So do you want joy? It's yours. Praise the Lord. Let's um, look at the Scripture together. Actually, rather than read it, I'm going to just break it down. First of all, we'll start with... We'll start with verse 3 to 6 of Philippians chapter 1. And I'm going to get you to kind of engage a little bit with the text because life's too short to read the Bible in a bland way. I thank God every time I remember you. Can everyone say thank? The first thing that he says in his jolly letter while he's in prison is what he's thankful for. Gee, Paul. I thank you, I thank my God every time I remember you, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with what? Joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident, everyone say confident, of this, that, let's read this together, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We're going to repeat that again. Let's say that again. That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, the first thing I want to say this morning about the things that bring joy, I believe that our attitudes can enhance joy in our life. And the great thing about your attitudes is that your wife and your husband and your family members are not responsible for your attitudes. Not only that, they can't control your attitudes. They've tried and they failed. Your attitudes are something that you are responsible for. And God, the Holy Spirit, actually gives you the ability to choose certain attitudes over others. Isn't that cool? And so there are certain attitudes that can help to foster and approaches that can help to foster joy in our life. The first thing that um, it says here is that it says that we can have confidence, and I want confidence in the future, but confidence comes from joy, but joy comes from thankfulness. Isn't that cool? So what's the first thing? The first thing is not just being confident of your future. God, I want to be confident for my future career. God, I want to be confident for my future ministry. God, I want to be confident for my future financial provision, my future family situation. It all starts not with confidence, not even with joy. It starts with thankfulness. Having a heart of thankfulness because I believe that actually when you receive the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that once we receive God's grace, the next logical thing is we have good works. You know, the first good work should always be the first good work. The first work that logically proceeds from faith in Jesus should always be thanksgiving. It's not saying, God, I'm going to do this, this, and this. It's not, I'm going to do all these good works. It's not, God, I'm going to renovate all of my, and change all my sin areas. It's saying, God, for your grace, before I do or say anything else, I just want to say thank you. I owe it all to you. Any of you have a posture of thankfulness? See, posture, thankfulness is not just words. It's a posture of life. It's saying, I am going to, from this point on, I'm going to predispose myself. I am going to posture myself. I'm going to make sure the culture of my life is towards being thankful for what I already have. And when you're thankful for what you already have, you start focusing on others and you start focusing on God before you start focusing on self. And even that step in itself starts to bring the next thing, is, which is joy. You see, Paul says, I thank God every time I remember you. And he says, I always pray with joy. You know why sometimes your joy life is not full of joy? It's because you're always praying for what you don't have in your own life. 
If you start praying God's blessing upon other people, like Paul was praying for the people in Philippi, he's in jolly chains, but his joy life, his, the joy in his prayer life is not about, oh God, I'm so joyful that I'm in chains. It's he's joyful because he's praying blessing upon the church in Philippi and seeing the kingdom of God break out in that area. And, and, and this idea of partnering, that if this community that he loves, they're doing amazing things and he feels like I'm sharing with that with my brothers and sisters. And so it brings him incredible joy. So joy comes second. It's the byproduct of having the Holy Spirit reshape and reframe everything. And joy is ultimately about others and the kingdom of God. And if we're struggling in our joy life, maybe our prayer life has become a little bit focused upon our own self-renovations and about and not about seeing other people flourish and thrive around us. And when you start seeing people flourish and thrive around you, pray God's blessing on, upon them, joy rises and confidence. And it says that we are confident that he who began the good work will carry on to completion. Our confidence is not in our ability, but it's in the sovereignty of God, knowing that hashtag he's got this. You can hashtag that. He's got this. Isn't that good? Isn't it good that when you fail, he's got this? Isn't that good? Isn't it good that your confidence is not in your ability? Isn't it good that your confidence is not in your sinless perfectionism. Your confidence is that he will carry on the good work. I love, you know, he doesn't just carry on the good work, he carries you. He carries you. In the same way that he is the author of your faith, he's the perfecter and he's the finisher of your faith. That's where our confidence comes from. Flip over to, so I believe God wants to give us some new attitudes this morning. Can I hear an Amen. There's some things that we can actually change in our life. It doesn't take a miracle. It just takes some shifts. Say, I want to be thankful. I want to, I, I, I want to be joyful in my prayer life about others. And I want to have confidence in God's sovereignty. And those attitudes actually shift and enhance our joy life. Secondly, I believe that friendships can bring joy. Do you believe that? I just, I think it's amazing that the elevated language in intimacy and relationship that we have in the New Testament, which was primarily written by single dudes. Have you ever thought about that? The great richness of understanding, even of married relationships, but arguably, singleness is elevated above marriage in the New Testament. Now, I know that's not always spoken of in churches, but arguably singleness is elevated as a greater good than even marriage. Like there's some explicit verses about it. The two most influential men in history, arguably, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and the Apostle Paul, were single men. And they lived and experienced life with intimacy of relationship that was not diminished by their single status. Verse um, 7 and 8, let's have a look at what Paul says. This is pretty interesting language. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. Wow, that doesn't sound like a bloke. Imagine if I just wrote Philip Bryce a letter and, and I said, Philip, I miss you, I have you in my heart. It just sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? I have you in my heart. You've got a special compartment in my heart, Philip. But Paul is saying, I have you in my heart. And whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you sharing God's grace with me, God can testify how I long for you. Wow. He's in prison and he's saying, I long for my family. I long for my brothers and sisters. This is evocative language. For all of you, with the affection of Christ Jesus. Isn't that true that Jesus has been affectionate towards us? You know what I mean? He has not been passive with his love. He has not been petty or stingy with his love. He's been affectionate. God the Father has been affectionate in his embrace of us. And, and when you understand the Father's affection towards us, you just want to say, thank you. I love you. And so this is the language that Paul uses. And you see, I believe that if you're going to have a growing joy life, you need to find friendships with people that you can not just do life with, but you can share your heart with. 
You see, if you can find, you, you can have fantastic friendships with people that don't love Jesus, but there will be a different dynamic to finding friendship and community and relationship with other people that long to and are thankful for Jesus in the same way that you are. Because there's nothing that unites people. Like, there's one thing to put people in the same proximity, the same school or the same family and say, you're united. But there's something that unites people and unites people's hearts greater than just putting them in the same place. And it's giving them a common purpose, giving them a common hunger, giving them a a, a common mission. And when we're moving together in mission and when we're getting tired, when we're getting hungry, when we're getting weary and we see other people walking along the road in the same direction as us, we say, wow, there is a friend that I can share my heart with on the journey and we can have intimacy of friendship that maybe I can't share that same level of intimacy with someone that doesn't understand my mission. Do you know what I mean? And so um, I believe that, that Paul... He saw the power of unified mission and journey to tie hearts together. True fellowship, the Greek word is koinonia, fellowship, communion. That's what we long for. True fellowship is not about having our social needs met, but about seeing our brothers and sisters thrive in life. Just the last couple of days I spent with some friends from this church, and when I hear what God is doing in their lives, when I hear of the sacrifices they're making for the kingdom, when I hear the difficulties and the hardships of their life, but they are still running the race with perseverance, do you know what it does? It enhances my love for them because we're on a journey together. We're not just in proximity together. I've got some friends that are very different to me. Norm Reed is very different to me. Um, He used to be a pastor here. He's a little bit older than me. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know how 30 years older than me. And he rings me up and he calls me Timmy. Well, I don't like it, but he does it anyway. Don't you call me Timmy. He goes, Timmy, how are you, Timmy? Timmy, how's your joy life going? I'm like, Norm, don't ask me that on a Monday morning. How dare you ask me that? I mean, how inconvenient. Imagine if I rang you and I said, how's your joy life going? Who are you? Stop preaching at me. And I'm like, Norm, ask me on Friday afternoon or ask me on the weekend when I'm relaxed, uh, drinking coffee, sitting down, relaxing, drinking coffee with that lid on. But he asked me that and he, he rings me and goes, Tim, Timmy, how's your soul? And he just, it's funny, we're so different, but when we catch up, I feel like he blesses me so much and he prays for me and we don't have to see each other very often, but I know I can pour my heart out to him and he's just going to encourage me, he's going to speak God's word into my life. And I just feel like, wow, there's, a, there, there's actually an intimacy and friendship that sometimes you don't have with people that you've got a lot more in common with. And I love that. I love that. And God's going to bring some people. Some of the, there's people in my life that, I, that, that God has tied my heart to theirs in friendship. And I only see them, I might only see them once a year or talk to them a couple times a year. I think you need to find friendships that bring you joy. Now, am I saying to dump all your friends? Now, we all have friends that when you meet up with them, it's like they deposit from your emotional bank account and there's not much more going in. And it's like, okay, I feel like I need a holiday after that coffee. Okay, it's okay to have friends like that because, because some people think that you're like that, you know, to them. So it's okay, but you need to find some friendships in your life that bring joy that remind you of the big picture, that where you can share your heart, where you can be reminded of what you already have in Jesus, where you can sense that we're brothers and sisters and we're moving together. Okay, so attitudes bring joy. Friendships bring joy. Circumstances, particularly bad ones, can bring opportunities for joy. Isn't that inconvenient? I wish it wasn't true. Let's look at this. Verse 12, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, I love being in chains. It's awesome. The prison food is amazing. No, he doesn't say that. What he says is, this situation has served a greater purpose. The health crisis that you're going through. Can it serve a greater purpose? 
the family situation you're going through? Can it, can it serve a greater purpose? And when you realize that the bad circumstance you're going through can serve a greater purpose, you can experience joy in the midst of trials. You can actually say, God, I believe by faith that you're going to use this and I have hope. And because I have hope, I can have a smile on my face knowing that this negative experience is not the full stop. Isn't that good? So, verse 13, as a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. What does that mean? That means that he's saying, get this. The whole of the people that are overseeing me in this prison, all of the guards, they are hearing about Jesus. They are seeing my life and they are observing me and they would not have seen this otherwise. Let me tell you this. There are some things that you've gone through and just going through a difficult circumstance, it has brought you along the path of people you never would have met otherwise. You know, in my own family situation, my son Josiah has been diagnosed with uh, autism spectrum disorder and uh he's it's it's been a journey for Nikki and I just working out what does it mean for having a child that's on the spectrum and um being a a parent of a child with special needs and do you know what we've realized in our community there's like so many families with children that have additional needs and special needs and they feel so lonely they feel so cut off from hope sometimes and you know what I realize there's so many rooms that I find myself in where I think I would never be in this room I would never be meeting with these people if Josiah uh, didn't have ASD and so am I glad that he's got ASD no no I'm not glad about it but do I believe that God can use it for gospel purposes absolutely absolutely and I actually believe that this church We have a vision to be a church for all people, last time I checked. And isn't it going to be great if people start coming to this church that say, I can't find a church anywhere that cares for my kid. But this church seems to care. And I I think, so God, what are you doing? What are you doing in the midst of difficult circumstance? Sorry, I didn't expect that. And the thing I love about the Bible is faith never fails to acknowledge what is in the here and now. It just says that what is here and now is not the full picture. And I have a bigger picture and I have a bigger plan. And I love you too much to not use you in your situation. I love the world too much not to use you for my kingdom purposes. It goes on the same verse 14. And because of my chains, most of my brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel. You know what? Some of you, what you've been through in your life, do you know that you inspire me? You know, when I remember when, Tani, when you went through your um, cancer battle, you inspired me so much because you just think, wow, I can't believe what that person's going through. And they have overcome and they have lived with victory despite going through incredible health crisis and you've inspired me to be more impassioned and more faith-filled. I look at our our beautiful adopted daughter, Gannett, who, um, and she's been through a tough time in just her journey and I think, wow, look at her. She's doing stuff for Jesus. She's an awesome youth leader. She's killing it at uni. She's going to be an amazing nurse. And I'm so proud and I just think, God, you know, when I get inspiration from seeing other people overcome. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, because I'm in prison, all the other Christians are getting pumped up. And they're saying, we want to be bold too. We don't want to be passive. We want to walk in the freedom that we have. Don't be Christians that look at all the things against us. You know, in our current political climate, oh, I'm going to get political now. You know, we can look at our schools and we can say, oh, no, all our schools are so anti Christian and anti the gospel, but do you know what the schools can't stop? The schools can't stop a 12-year-old girl that loves Jesus telling her friends that I was lost and I was found, I was blind, but now I see I was hopeless and now I have hope. You can't stop an on-fire follower of Jesus. 
And so let's stop focusing on what's against us and say, actually, sometimes our circumstances can serve the gospel purposes of God. Can I hear an amen? Let's look at verse 15. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy or rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm here, uh, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Oh, I love this passage. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a little song that I used to sing when I was a kid. In the Church of Christ, at Menai Church of Christ, in the suburbs of Sydney. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. And I don't know what it is. After all these years, whenever I sing it, doesn't matter how gloomy I feel, I just start singing it and it just keeps flowing and flowing and flowing. And all of a sudden, I just my, my legs start moving and I feel, mate, the joy flows. Because when you rejoice, it's an expression of an internal joy. You can't say, oh, yeah, I'm rejoicing metaphorically. No. To rejoice is actually to rejoice. And um, there's, a, there's an old school song. It used to say, rejoice, rejoice, Christ is in you. The hope of glory in our hearts. He lives, he lives, his breath is in you. Arise, a mighty army, he ri- or something like that. We arise. And it was just like, rejoice, rejoice, Christ is in you. The hope of glory. And these words about the finished work of Jesus, the victory of Jesus gives us the ability to have victory over our small little apparent defeats. The big victory of Jesus. And I just believe that the normal Christian life is one of rejoice. And Paul just says, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. It's almost like he's saying, I'm in change, you lot. And I'm rejoicing. No one can stop me. Just like back in Paul and Silas in prison. No one can stop me. I'm going to rejoice because it's who I am. I have the Holy Spirit. I have the spirit of joy. And I'm going to rejoice. You know what I love about this? (laughs) He's rejoicing in the midst of what would have at first glance, been about discouragement. Because what's happening in this text? It appears that Christians are preaching the gospel in such a way to cause trouble for Paul so he can't be released from prison. Now, the commentators, there's different readings of it, but this is a very legitimate reading of the text. That they weren't pagans, that they weren't heretics. They were Christians that just didn't like Paul And they were happy to go about their business to keep Paul in jail. (laughs) Aren't Christians annoying sometimes? Do you know that the people that can cause you the most discouragement in your life are are Christians? Because, Because it's like, oh, they're meant to be better than that. Or they're such a hypocrite. And, you know, if someone was to walk in here like... A human, humanistic, naturalistic, atheist was to walk in here and start abusing me. It would not discourage me one iota. I might get annoyed, but I wouldn't be discouraged. But if someone that I love, someone close to me, let me down, that discourages me. I once heard a preacher say that if you let a hypocrite stand between you and God, the hypocrite's closer to God than you. And we spend a lot of time stressing and obsessing about Christians that are doing the wrong thing. You know what Paul says? Ha, ha, ha. Those people, they think they're doing me a disservice by preaching the gospel to keep me in prison. And he's basically saying, hey, I'll stay here. As long as the gospel's being preached, the message of Jesus, I believe God the Holy Spirit's going to use it so we can't lose. Because the victory has been won by Jesus. So even if they've got bad motives, if they're preaching about the sufficiency of the cross, if they're su- preaching about forgiveness in Jesus, then that's great because I believe in the victory of God and not in my own strength. And so has this. If you're living a joyful life, you can even turn discouragement around and you can do a victory dance in return. Someone tries to discourage you and you're like, nah, I'm just going to do a victory dance. Rejoice, rejoice. And you just, because... You don't give hypocrites power over your life. Don't you dare. Give God power over your life. Not hypocrites. Because there's a day coming where you'll be a hypocrite. But I'm a, we all fall short of the glory of God. That's why we have a Savior called Jesus. He's a perfect representative and ambassador. 
So our victories are built upon the victory secured by Jesus. Verse 19, it says, For I know through the prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. You see, he says, basically, no matter what, I know that what's happened will turn out for my deliverance. I will be delivered because I already have been delivered. You can have joy because you have hope. You have hope that things will turn. You have hope that God will bring joy in the shadows. You have hope that God is going to smile on tomorrow, that there will be tears and sorrow in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalm 30. And because Jesus was raised from the dead, he has secured that we too will be raised. Will you stand to your feet?